Good day. Welcome to uh, Ruby in today's live event. Um, we have the um, pleasure of having Chef Jackie Pfeiffer with us from the French Pastry School. Today we're going to be talking about Thanksgiving desserts and uh, we're going to be showing you a few technique videos throughout um, our French pastry course that we've just launched called the Introduction to Pastry Arts. So I'm going to introduce Chef uh, Jackie. He's going to tell you tell him a little bit about himself and then we'll dive into uh, our recipe. So um, welcome, Chef Jackie. This is our first live event together. Um, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Scott. I'm uh, very excited to be part of this live event and to be uh, uh, part of uh, the Ruby family. Uh, a few words about myself and also Chef Sebastian, who, uh, who uh, uh, helped me uh, co-found the French Pastry School uh, 25 years ago in Chicago. Uh, before that, we uh, uh, were trained uh, back home in France, a classic French training uh, that uh, happened uh, during an apprentice apprenticeship. And um, we both did that and worked in a few places in France. And then we decided to travel around the world and uh, work in different continents and uh, hotels and bakeries. And for some reason, because we did not know each other at the time, we ended up in Chicago, of all the places, at the same time in 1991. And we became friends and uh, we could never find enough uh, professionally trained employees. And we decided to open a school that is dedicated to pastry, baking and cake decorating only. And that was uh, 1995. And... Um, since then, we've been uh, operating our brick and mortar school uh, throughout those years and, and uh, teaching not only uh, programs, uh, six month program, a four month program, and we taught also continuing education classes, hands on. And uh, after so many years, we decided to uh, spice things up and uh, find uh, the right partner to provide uh, some of our content online for anybody to uh, follow uh, uh, in the privacy of their own home. And, and uh, Ruby uh, uh, was presented to us and we realized right away that this was the right partner for us as they, um, they have excellent instruction, beautiful videos, beautiful content and great assessments. And so we uh, forged a partnership with them uh, a few months ago. And, and uh, last September, uh, we launched the uh, Introduction to Pastry Art course, uh, which is um, a great course, I think, uh, for the people who want to all learn about pastry. People are afraid of pastry and baking, but also people who uh, know a little bit about baking, they but they want more information. They want to know more than the why and the how recipes work. <clears throat> so we just went through our first cohort and uh, uh, I have been grading the students together with our teachers here at the French Pastry School. And, and I'm, uh, I'm very, very happy to see the dedication of the students and, and how well they are doing. And uh, I'm glad that the system works so well because for us this was new, but it works really well because the students can actually watch again a video or ask us questions and they get real support from us. So I'm um, very pleased that after so many years in pastry, uh, 44 years now, but who's counting, that uh, uh, we are av available uh, to, to show uh, our content to anybody out there who wants to know more about this beautiful profession. Oh, great. So thank you, Jackie. Um, this has been a great relationship. We started uh, working uh, together this summer on creating what this might look yep. like. And we wanted to have a little bit of baking, uh, of some desserts, um, some candy making. So this course that we're talking about has all of those and it takes about 60 hours. There's about 19 units. And as Chef was telling you, it's unique in that you get to upload your 
images of the work that you're doing and have Chef Jackie and team grade that. So we're gonna go into a few of the key videos from this course to show you what you can use for Thanksgiving. I've already chosen a few that I wanna make. One would be baguettes, classic baguettes. I remember making them <laughs> years ago, but I don't make them on a regular basis. And uh, I look forward to getting that perfect baguette. I still spend, you know, two, three, four bucks. When I go buy a baguette, my kids love bon sandwiches. That's been my favorite lately. So I'm gonna make baguettes in addition to the pear tart. Um, I used to make this years ago in a uh, French restaurant in Seattle, but I haven't gotten back to that. So I'm looking forward to making that too. So uh, the first uh, video we're gonna show you is sweet dough. Um, Chef, you wanna tell us a little bit about sweet dough and where you would use this in your cooking? Yes, a sweet dough is a, it's a, a dough uh, in French, it's called pâte sucrée. Uh, that's your first French lesson of the day. And uh, it contains a, a fair amount of sugar and eggs compared to, let's say, pie dough, uh, which usually does not contain eggs or sugar. So sweet, uh, sweet dough is usually ma meant for mainly sweet pies. It would not make any sense to make a, a quiche or a savory pie with sweet dough, okay? And the sweet dough is uh, because uh, it has a decent amount of sugar, sugar uh, actually makes things not only color uh, in the oven, but it also makes them turn hard. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, it, it's, it's a, a nice and sturdy um, crust that will uh, uh, hold nicely any filling, even if it's a filling that contains a lot of moisture. Okay. Um, Patrick, let's uh, let's show that video that we have for the actual beginning of making the sweet dough with the flour. Mix in one third of the flour on low speed. Then mix in the remaining flour until it is well incorporated. Okay, so that was just a snippet of uh, how to add the flour and not to overmix. Yes, um, very important. Yeah, very and then important. this concept of uh, the next one we're gonna show you is fragier. So tell us about Fasier. the flour and the not overmixing. Fasier, I, I knew I was gonna Fasier. pronounce that wrong. Fasier. <laughs> Close. Thank you, Chef. So go ahead and tell us why we don't want to um, overmix the flour. So flour contains gluten, and gluten is very useful when we want to make a bread dough, bread loaves. Bread loaves uh, uh, hold their shape only because we activated gluten. And uh, I always tell my students that uh, they, they have a hard time to imagine gluten in their head. And, and I tell them gluten is like powdered rubber bands, that, that it, it's a powder uh, that is in the flour. And as soon as you add water to that, to that flour, this powdered rubber band just becomes one rubber band, okay? Obviously you need to mix it for that rubber band to become elastic. And this is why, uh, like I said, bread loaves hold their shape. And it not only does this, but it also kind of like toughens up the dough a little bit. So for bread making, it's wonderful. For anything like a, a sweet dough or even like a pound cake, you cannot overmix the flour because if you overmix that flour, you are going to activate that gluten and you are going to make that dough rubbery. And unfortunately, the the, the time where you find out if you overmix that, that dough will be during the baking time. And in the worst case scenario, the, the dough actually shrinks and, and comes off from the side of the, of the pan and the filling goes pouring out. So it's a big disaster. Uh, and um, so that's why we always caution people to not overmix the dough. Uh, if you want to talk about the phrase dough now, or uh, you want to yeah. do that, Scott? Yeah, so let's the go phrase, into the, the phrase. The phrase, that's your second French lesson of the day, is uh, it's pretty much, it's shown in the video, it's pretty much taking the dough and just scraping it once or twice on the surface. And that's not to activate the gluten. It's just to make sure the ingredients are really well mixed 
with each other and this is going to make a door that will uh, that will uh, perform very well so we're just talking about one or two scrapes don't go crazy and just scrape 20 times because you are going to over over mix uh, the dough and activate the gluten yeah that's interesting uh let's show the video here patrick when i was younger i learned to do this with the palm of my uh, hand and just to do it yes. once but having a pastry scraper is unique let's show that patrick yes. transfer the dough to the work surface and scrape the dough towards you using a flat dough scraper Okay, so chef, that is a unique method with the pastry scraper, um, but the same thing, you don't want to do it too much. It's not a matter of over no. and over, just once or twice, right? Yes, just once or twice, and that's it. Leave it alone. All right. Um, so the next step is uh, how to roll the dough. So once we've made the dough, we've wrapped it in plastic, we've refrigerated it. Um, you can make uh, an extra batch to put in the freezer. Um, yes. But the next uh, technique I want you to talk about, chef, is how to roll the dough. You know, I've had issues in the past where I bring it out of the refrigerator and I try to roll it. You know, there's some few steps you need to know. Yes. So rolling rolling dough is one of one of the nemesis of, of many students. Uh, uh, we, as I mentioned, we, we've been teaching 25 years and there's there's just some techniques that just keep on coming back uh, as as a problem. And um, after after so many years of teaching, we can identify not only the problems but the solutions. And um, a solution for somebody at home is to, to find some kind of a silicone mat that they put on the table. And uh, the reason why this is very useful is because if you press the dough too hard, the dough will stick to the silicone mat. It won't be sticking to the work surface. So it's very, very useful. And usually those silicone mats have a smooth side that we put on the table and a rougher side that we that we have showing up. And this rougher side, once you put a little bit of flour before you roll the dough, the flour will go in between the, the creases. And, and uh, well, it's very, very useful uh, when rolling dough. And um, another thing about rolling dough, I could talk half an hour about rolling dough, but let's just, uh, let's just talk about the essentials, is rolling dough is never about strength i see a lot of people putting so much effort so much strength and it's actually not like this at all it's you have to be very precise you have to roll i always say you go roll one two three times back and forth it's always a back and forth motion and not very uh, you don't have to press a lot and then you got to turn the, the door uh, 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 to the right and then continue rolling again and if the dough gets sticky, add a little flour. If it gets really sticky, you take your wholesale part, your, your silicone mat, and you transport all this in the refrigerator or in the freezer. So it's very, very uh, easy to do like this. And, and um, another mistake that I see a lot is people bring out the dough from the refrigerator first, and then they go looking for the rolling pin, the silicone mat and the flour and this and that. And 10 minutes later, we start rolling the dough and the dough is not too soft because of the, the butter in the dough. So, so my advice is get all your equipment ready and then pull out the dough. Yep, I agree. I've, uh, I'm really adamant about the same thing. Bring it out. And what's your opinion about pounding the dough with the, the rolling pin uh, to kind of yes, soften it up? Yeah. So when the dough, when the dough, uh, we recommend that um, after you make the dough, that you let it sit in the refrigerator overnight. And the reason for this is the 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 starch in the flour is going to absorb the water in the recipe. Okay. That's why rolling freshly made dough is always difficult because it's too sticky. But if you let the dough stick, sit in the refrigerator overnight, that water has been absorbed completely by the starch in the flour, and now it's rollable, okay? So <clears throat> the dough has been sitting in the refrigerator overnight, and now it's pretty much hard like a rock because of the butter. And, and uh, people like to just start rolling out 
uh, immediately, but what you would need to do is to tap, put the dough on the silicon mat, a little bit of flour, and you tap it uh, uh, on each side, back and forth. And what this will do, it will actually uh, soften the dough a little bit and then make it more pliable and more rollable. Okay, so the tapping is very important. Okay, excellent detail. Um, let's show the video, Patrick, on rolling the dough. And just to give everybody a quick insight on the format of this live event, for those of you who have been here before, we're going to go over uh, five different recipes and talk about the techniques. And then we'll go into a Q&A and uh, stump the chef. So if you could show us that video, Patrick. Position the silpat mat with the shiny side down, textured side up on your work surface. Gently tap it to soften and flatten using a rolling pin. Keeping the rolling pin parallel with the edge of the table and with your hands open and on the ends of the pin, begin rolling with the middle of the pin directly over the dough. Begin rolling from the center to the top and from the center to the bottom. Okay, excellent. So does uh, that thing's a little bit more uh, insight as to what it looks like because Chef Jackie could go on for a, a long time about this, but anything yes. else you want to elaborate on the, yes. the dough? Yes, I actually have a, a last trick of the trade is uh, 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 if, if, if the dough still gets too sticky, uh, a, a trick is to take a cutting board, a wooden cutting board, and to stick it in a freezer for a half an hour. And then you put this cutting board on your uh, table, your work surface, you put the, sil the, the silicon mat on it, and then you roll on the frozen cutting board. And that definitely will keep the dough nice and cool during the entire process. Yeah, I know that when I was working in a, a French kitchen, we had a marble um, yes. counter in the back yeah. that was cool. And that's what we used all the time for the dough so yes. that we can uh, yeah. spend a little bit more time. Yeah. We, 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 we do this here, but at home, uh, uh, not many people have a, a piece of marble they can, they can stick in the freezer. So yeah. a cutting board, everybody has, has a cutting board and uh, it works really well. I have to say, uh, anybody uh, I gave this trick, they, they're very happy to, to hear about it. So I'm going to ask you a question, Chef. Um, I have the issue sometimes, and I've seen a lot of students ask the same question with regards to when you roll the dough out, the edges crack and yes. tend to crumble. And you're like, well, what are we going to do with that? How do you get by that? Or is it just, there's there a trick? Well, it's, it's, it's part of the tapping, the dough tapping. And, uh, and also you can, you can just like hold the dough a little bit on the edges a little bit so the the heat of your hand is is actually going to soften it and ag again if you roll if you roll a dough gradually uh on uh back and forth two three times and then turn the dough uh, a little bit roll it again if you go gradually like this the cracking is very very minimal very minimal uh okay. um but still um at the end of the day, once once you start rolling a dough like this that is sticky, that can get sticky, we're talking about, you have about a minute and a half time until your dough is completely rolled out. You cannot spend three, four, five minutes on that dough. That it's, it is going to get sticky even for professionals like us. So get all your equipment ready, get your dough out, tap, 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 and start rolling. And also, um, we recommend that people use ro rolling guides on, on both sides, which are very important. They're little silicone bars that you can purchase. And, uh, and they are at the thickness that you want. They come in many different thicknesses. And then this way, you don't have to worry, oh, is it too thick? Is it too thin? Just press until you hit the bars. And then your dough will have the same thickness everywhere. And it will bake the same because if on one side your dough is super thick and the other one is super thin, the super thick side will not be baked while the thin one will be burned. Yeah, those uh, those guys were new to me. I haven't seen those. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, I got to find those. So yes. uh, let's move on. We will take questions uh, on all the details of what we're presenting here at the end. But we uh, just a little preview. We're going to go into a baguette. Uh, we're going to go into... Uh, ice cream, vanilla ice cream with a raspberry coulis. Yes. Uh, we're yes. going to talk about a, a cherry pie, which there's four different components to the cherry pie. 
and then we're going to get into the pear tart that I mentioned. So let's uh, yes. let's move into baguette. Before we roll the video, do you have anything you want to talk about with the baguette, chef? I'm sure you do. Well, baguette is a uh, it's a uh, it's a bread that uh, many people love because you can make great sandwiches with it. Uh, it represents friends and this and that. But at the end of the day, it's it's um it's a white bread and uh, it, it it's actually doable for um, for people at home. Our recipe for baguette is actually entirely made by hand. And uh, I am grading the students and they, they really are doing a fantastic job with with this recipe. So they, they can get the freshest baguette at home made by themselves uh, for, for Thanksgiving. I think this is wonderful. All right, so let's uh, go to the first. There's a few steps um, to make a perfect baguette. The first one is the water temperature calculation. So let's roll that, Patrick. On the second day, begin the final dough. Calculate and adjust the temperature of the water to the required base temperature of 62 degrees Celsius. These. All right, so water temperature calculation. How important is this, Jeff? <laughs> it's crucial. It's crucial. Uh, 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 if you see if you see a recipe uh, that you you find wherever in a book or in a magazine and it tells you to to use lukewarm water for your dough, it it's dangerous because uh, right now Scott you are in uh, San Francisco and let's say let's say the weather is a little warmer than here in Chicago right let's say you are uh, you are uh, at 80 degrees and your kitchen is warm, there's no air conditioning. And um, so now your, your uh, flour that is in your pantry is warm, your kitchen is warm, and you, you follow a recipe that asks for lukewarm water. Well, guess what will happen? <clears throat> your yeast is gonna be put in an environment that is too hot, and the yeast is going to uh, do what it does best, it's creating carbon dioxide and make the dough rise out of control, okay? Right. And uh, when that happens, it gets a foul smell. It's not a sour, sour dough smell, it's a foul smell, okay? And in the same token, let's say I'm in Chicago here and it's cold, it's a little cold today. And uh, if I would use uh, cold, uh, cold flour, cold kitchen and let's just say cold water for whatever reason, the yeast is going to be in such a cold environment, it's not going to react at all. It's just going to sit there and the dough will not rise. So in our, in our program, we have a system which is a calculation and that takes into account the temperature of your room, where you are, your kitchen, temperature of your flour, and then with those two, with a very simple calculation, it will take into account the difference of temperature of those two, and it will the, it will provide the exact temperature of the liquid, uh, in this case is water, that you should use to uh, make this dough. So for you, you're in a warmer environment, your liquid is gonna be colder because you are in a warm environment. I'm in a cold environment, my liquid is gonna be warmer. You see you see how this yep. works? Yeah, that was a great video in the program um, on the calculation and how um, precise you. it needs to be. So the next step is uh, mixing the dough. And uh, we're gonna show a video right now that's kind of unique in terms of you're not really needing it. So let's show the video, then you can talk about this technique, Chef. Passage en tête the dough using both hands. Clip the dough with your thumb and index finger and stack the pieces on top of each other. Continue to passage en tête for approximately 10 minutes or until the gluten structure is developed. All right, so Chef, what can you tell me about that method? It's almost like a, a, a tear instead of a knead. <laughs> yes, uh, it's, uh, it's two techniques, two, two techni techniques, uh, that's more French for you. One is called passage en tête, is a technique where you just squish the, 
squish the dough, you kind of like cut it in pieces, you cut the head off almost, uh, and, then, and then towards the end, uh, you will see uh, a technique where you fold the dough over, this is called soufflage, souffle in French means to blow, that means we're putting air in the dough. First, we mix it to activate the gluten, and then we just incorporate air, and this air will feed the yeast, uh, and the yeast will then make carbon dioxide. <clears throat> when we put this program together, Scott, I insisted on having this recipe because it's made by hand. And from, uh, again, teaching for so long, learning how to know what dough feels in your hand mm -hmm. will go all the way to your, to your brain. And once you know what this dough is supposed to feel like, then later on, if one day you want to make the same dough or different dough with a machine, when you touch the dough to check the, the consistency, you will know exactly how this feels. Smart. Great, yeah. great, uh, great uh, memory that you are building when you do that. Yeah, I look forward to doing this. So now mm -hmm. that we've uh, um, mixed the dough by hand, we're going to shape the dough. So let's uh, show you a little snippet on that. Fold for a second time and then a third time. Then smooth the shape and cover it with plastic wrap. Let it rest for 30 minutes at room temperature. Thanks, shape, scoring next. Okay, so that's shaping the dough. What's important when you shape the dough? I see that there's a kind of a, a push and pull technique going on. <laughs> yes, there's a push and pull and there's also a, a sealing the dough. We seal the dough, we create a seal, but also it's that's a crucial step, the, the shaping of the baguette, is because if you shape it too tightly, some people get really excited and they shape it very tightly. They are actually making, a, a, they, they will make a dough that is just too tight and the crumb will be too tight. You will not have a lot of little holes, air bubbles. <clears throat> and if you, if you fold it too loosely, you'll get big holes like right. this. And it'll be difficult to put jam on this piece of bread, you know? So, yeah. so the shaping is very important. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it looks as though that minimal kneading or developing the gluten is happening. Just yes. the perfect yes. shape. Yes. Excellent. So this next thing I learned about scoring the baguettes. Let's, let's score the baguettes, uh, Patrick. Score the baguettes on a diagonal seven times. So interesting. Um, I learned that there's seven, five or seven um, score marks. What, why is that, Chef? Yes, uh, it's 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 more pleasing visually. Uh, uh, four, uh, five is 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 better than four or six. So it's just a question of visual. Uh, but also, when you score a baguette, you need to uh, you need to go for it. You need to go kind of like fast. If you go slowly, your your uh, blade is gonna get stuck in the dough. And I'm telling you this because of teaching for so long. So scoring dough, it's not something you can do carefully, uh, really slowly. You just have to, it's really slashing the dough. And we go, yeah. going in the dough about a quarter inch uh, deep. Okay. So obviously there's some steps between the shaping of the dough that you saw in the video yes. and the, yes. the loaf of the scoring in the dough. So we're just taking snippets yes. out of the program to show you key yes. points. Um, and what is the reason? Why do we score? Oh, you score it so the, 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 the steam, the water in the dough, there's about 60-70% water in, in French bread uh, dough and that water needs to escape from somewhere uh, you could do the experiment and, and not score one baguette and that it will come out like whatever it wants to be. The, the steam is going to come out right. where in the, uh, through the weaker spot of the baguette. So if you cut holes, predetermined holes, the, the steam is going to come out from those holes and it's going to lift a little bit the edge of the, the scores. It's going to make it look very pretty. 
Interesting for the the scoring uh, tool. There it looks like an exacto knife. Um, uh, you can use an exacto knife. You can use a razor blade. Uh, mm -hmm. Any really sharp sharp uh, blade will do. Yeah, I've been uh, like probably a lot of people making sourdough in the the last uh -huh. few months. I, yeah. I started. I made my own uh, starter probably back in April, and then I've been making sourdough. And I don't have an exacto or a uh, razor blade at home, so I've been using my parry knife. But I noticed that I have to sharpen it every time before I do those quick slices no because I did it with a dull no one and I just ripped it. Yeah, no paring knife. Uh, any, any, it's just a razor blade from any uh, uh, convenience store will do. You can just carefully hold it yep. and, then, uh, and then you'll be good to go, you know? All right, so let's show the next one um, actually baking and then we'll uh, show you a final uh, baguette. Yes. Turn off the oven for 10 minutes. Then turn the oven back on and lower the temperature to 430 degrees Fahrenheit for 12 minutes. About that term. <laughs> All right, so that's kind of a, a cool shot of them actually baking and browning in the, in the oven. Chef, what can you tell us yeah. about the, the temperature and the importance of uh, preheating the oven? Oh, preheating the oven is, is so crucial for any anything you bake. I still have people who put things in the oven cold and then they turn on the oven and I don't know, I don't know what to say. You have to preheat the oven and then, uh, and for baguettes, we put a stone in the, in the oven. Uh, it's not necessary, but it, it helps to retain the heat. And, uh, and uh, after filming all those videos, we became geeks. And, uh, and we asked our technician, Jeff, to create a, a Baker Vision. <clears throat> so he is, uh, he, any product that is being baked in our videos, uh, we show the process of how the product rises and bakes. And actually, you can learn an, an enormous amount of, of information by just looking at this yeah. uh, um, when it goes well and when it goes wrong, you see? If a recipe goes wrong and, and you could actually do a, a time lapse, you would actually almost figure out why it went wrong. So is there any sort of steam injection or moisture being added to this uh, baguette process? Yes, uh, um, uh, a little pan on the bottom of the oven that we put, little cheat tray. And then we, we be, right when we put the baguettes in the oven, we put a little, little small amount uh, a small uh, glass of water in there, and that will create the, the create the steam uh, uh, because we are aware that uh, almost nobody has a, a steam injector in their right. own oven at home. And what's the what's the reason for the steam? The steam actually creates a shield around the baguette. It, it creates like a, 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 a kind of like a yeah, it's a shield of of, of particles of mini particles of water and what what this will do it will protect the baguette from the intense heat because we're baking at 400 plus degrees so it protects the baguette uh, from that harsh heat in the beginning of the baking yeah. and the baguette will have a chance to rise one last time until it gets too hot and then the yeast eventually dies <clears throat> okay well, let's show the final shot of uh, what the final baguette looks like, Patrick. Enjoy our traditional French baguette with butter and jam, sandwiches, or dipped in soups and stews. All right, excellent. So, uh, Chef, the final baguette, the hero shot. Yes. Um, let's move on to uh, the next recipe we want to talk about, which is ice cream. And I've been making ice cream for years. Um, and this is a great basic vanilla ice cream. I learned years ago when I was working at the herb farm in Seattle, outside of Seattle in Woodinville, how to infuse um, whatever flavor I wanted, herbs in most of the cases, um, at the ice cream. But let's show the first step on uh, properly uh, heating the ice cream. And then, Chef, we can talk a little bit about your uh, background on it. Yes. Place the milk, vanilla bean and seeds, cream, sugar, honey, and egg yolks into a saucepan on low heat. Whisk to incorporate the ingredients. 
Increase to medium heat, constantly stirring until nap consistency, or it coats the back of a spoon and reaches 180 degrees Fahrenheit using a spatula. All right, so what's the most important thing here, Chef, when you're making your ice cream base? So in the, in the liquid, we have our, our cream and our vanilla bean. Yes. You can see the vanilla bean and, and, and some yes. sweetener, be it honey or sugar. And yes. then there's the adding the egg yolks. Let me yes. turn it over to you from here for the most important concepts. It's uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, infusing infusing uh, the milk and cream is the nice, nice part of the recipe. The other part, which is very crucial is to make sure we heat our um, ice cream mix hot enough, make it hot enough so we pasteurize the egg yolks. <clears throat> because ice cream is not a product that is baked. Most baked, baked products, uh, if we use uh, egg yolks that are, that are uh, uh, sitting out for uh, a few minutes until the recipe is made, nothing bad will happen. Nobody's gonna get sick because those products all get baked and everything dies <clears throat> in the oven. For ice cream, it's not the case because uh, if you don't cook it properly and uh, you have a faulty thermometer or you're not paying attention, and now you are uh, keeping your egg yolk in what we call the danger zone. And the danger zone is a temperature from 41 to 141 Fahrenheit where the bacteria in the eggs are very happy, they are reproducing like crazy. And <clears throat> if if this mix does not reach at least one, 180, 185, you are you're not killing those bacteria. And and also eventually later on you're gonna have to cool this mix, and that has to be done very quickly so those those bacteria uh, fall asleep and stop reproducing. So there's there's some it's just basic uh, mm -hmm. and nobody needs to freak out making ice cream. It's just basic pasteurization of the egg yolks and and then after that uh, everything will go well. But uh, if it's not done well, you're freezing the ice cream and you're churning the ice cream and you think everything is fine, but yep. the, the bacteria are just asleep when they're frozen, but they'll wake up as soon as uh, they come back to a warmer temperature. So what about the concept of tempering egg yolks? I know this is always a teaching point I have when I'm teaching people how to make ice cream so that you don't you know, turn it into scrambled eggs. What's the, the key here? Yeah, well, uh, for, for us, it's common sense because um, if, you, if you have a hot liquid and, you, um, and uh, hot milk, let's say, that is close to boiling stage and you, you pour egg yolks in there, what will happen to those egg yolks? They, they can very easily curdle, scramble, yeah? Yep. So it's always good to uh, temper those egg yolks, put, a, put some hot liquid in the egg yolk, stir, put those egg yolks now back in the mix, or you put the egg yolks in the mix uh, when the mix is cold, in the beginning of the mixing, and, and then you just continue stirring so nothing will happen. Uh, but pouring egg yolks in any kind of hot liquid will make them scramble. Okay, so I just want to add a tidbit of my experience here. Um, so the video showed you just kind of the hot, you know, the hot pot of the, the cream. Whenever yeah. I'm making ice cream and I want to make something above and beyond the vanilla ice cream, I'm not just steeping the vanilla bean, but I'm going to add a flavor to it. So you can consider you're making a, a cream tea. So I'm yes. going to be making a, a bay leaf ice cream for my pear tart uh, this week nice. because I have a bay tree in the back. So the same thing, I'm going to bring it to a, a scald add the vanilla bean and add some bay leaf and let it sit for a half an hour to infuse. Yes. And then I'll bring it back up to temperature to uh, bring it to that 180 with the egg yolks after I do the tempering. Uh, absolutely. You can infuse this milk and cream with teas, coffees, uh, spices, any kind of spices. Uh, and, uh, and it becomes uh, an extension from a vanilla ice cream. Yeah. Uh, um, and then also, you can also add other things like nut butters. Uh, you can make a peanut ice cream. You can add chocolate. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing wrong with that, right? And, uh, and uh, so the, the recipe, the reason why we pick vanilla ice cream is because it's the, it's the base of all ice creams. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you can add things in there to make it fun. 
Yeah, years ago in a restaurant in Seattle, I used to make a, a honey lavender ice cream with local honey and ha lavender we grew. And then I made these little cat's tongue cookies. What are they called, Lang de Chat? Yes, Lang de Chat. Yeah, and added lemon zest to that. So the cookie, a few of them, so you can just scoop the ice cream with the cookie, perfect combination. And, so we and wanna... uh, while, while we talk about playing with ice cream, you, you can play with the infusion, but you cannot just add just more su more sugar just because you you want to one needs to know that sugar affects the freezing point and too much sugar will just not allow your ice cream to turn hot yep it's something i do with a sorbet i, I have a refractometer to text the brick test the brick yeah. so i can make yeah. any sort of survey yes. with a 22 percent brick so i've never done that for sh for ice cream yes. because i have a, a standard proportion that i do of liquid and cream and and a sweetener be it sugar or honey yeah it doesn't read uh, in the refractory. All right, so let's move on to what goes with this ice cream, uh, raspberry coolie. Let's show you that video on uh, making a coolie. Adding the sugar and lemon juice to the puree right away will help preserve the color. When it simmers, add the bloomed gelatin. Allow it to simmer for a few minutes, then turn off the heat. Add the honey. All right, so Chef, uh, Raspberry Coulee, what are the, the key points here you want the, the group to know? Well, we, uh, we, um, we want to make sure the, the fruit is uh, nice and fresh. It could be frozen fruit, it's okay. Uh, um, and then uh, we need to put, we usually like to put a little bit of sugar, uh, but a little bit of uh, lemon, lemon uh, juice. If you feel frisky, you can put a little bit of liquor. And uh, also you need some, something to make it gel. So in our recipe, we have a gelatin. It can be any kind of gelatin, uh, uh, fish gelatin, uh, 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 any kind of gelatin is fine. But we want that coolie to, um, once it gets colder, to get kind of like a, a kind of like a thick sauce consistency. So whenever we swirl it with the ice cream, it's going to mix really well and it's going to keep its shape. And what's the key to uh, keeping the color? You know, I saw something that uh, with the acid and the temperature. What should we know about that? Well, yeah, if you cook, if you cook the entire uh, uh, coolie, it will turn from bright red to kind of like a off red, almost slight, slight tones of purple. So right. we just take a little bit of, of puree and then warm it up with and add the gelatin to it and then add it to the rest of the puree. Okay. Um, let's do uh, the next video, which is mixing and churning the ice cream. Yes. Homogenize the ice cream base using an immersion blender. Strain the mixture and pour into the ice cream maker. Churn it until it is a creamy and smooth consistency. So I saw uh, the contraption you had with the, the KitchenAid. Um, that's something I used to yes. have long ago where I had to hand crank it. Uh, and then I've you know, <laughs> since then got the Cuisinart, you know, tabletop. But uh, tell us about what's most important about the ice cream and turning this. Well, uh, everything has to be cold. The ice cream mix has to be stone cold. I recommend that you keep it in the refrigerator overnight. And, uh, and your bowl, in this case, the KitchenAid bowl, has to be in the freezer overnight. And then if those two are super cold, then uh, the mixing of the ice cream uh, takes about 15, 15 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has to be done fairly quickly. Uh, otherwise the water crystals, the water will turn into big crystals if this process takes too long, you see? Right. And, uh, and also if, if the churn is churning too slowly, also, the, the water will, will have a chance to, to turn into big crystals and make icy ice cream, and nobody likes that. So a couple of things I learned uh, the hard way when I was younger and uh, learning to make ice cream is that I added the ice cream base, and it wasn't cold enough, but my yes. canister was, and it took 20 to 30 minutes to churn, and you can tell me what happened. I had developed little lumps of butter, so I churned the cream <laughs> within the ice cream and then I had lumps of butter, and after I froze it, I was like, "What is going on?" So that that's Seriously. that's a that's a problem, right? <laughs> yeah, not good, not good, Scott. Okay. 
No. So what I, I turned little, little to do disappointed. is... Uh, I know. This was when I was 19, teaching okay. myself. <laughs> okay. Not too long ago. <laughs> Not too long ago, yesterday. So what I do now is I take a bowl, ice bowl, a double uh, bowl, and then with a rubber spatula, make sure that my base is extremely cold yes. and then as add it to as it. Possible. Yes. As cold as possible. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's see the combination of vanilla ice cream and raspberry coulis. Patrick? Enjoy the delicious flavor combination of French vanilla ice cream with raspberry coulis. I love that combination. I haven't uh, done that in a uh, jar like that ever before, but I think I want to do that. It's it's nice. It's nice visually. You know, you we did it in a jar so people can can see that they, they at home they could do it in glasses mm -hmm. and uh, and and then pre prepare those things before the a dinner dinner party. Have them ready to go. So so dessert is not a problem. It's already taken care of. And uh, while we, while we were talking about the coolie, uh, I want to say that this technique of coolie making can be used for a different fruit. You can make peach, coolie, mango, whatever you want, blueberry, you name it. The technique will stay the same. Uh, it just the flavor can be different. So you were talking of making a, a different ice cream. So imagine a different ice cream now with a different coolie. Yep, love it. So, uh, you know, all these little snippets of videos we're showing you today, um, there are the whole videos along with the recipe. So every, I think there's about 40 recipes in this program, all have yes. a video and a recipe step-by-step, -step, similar to all Ruby programs. So this is really neat to kind of take your information and place it into the Ruby platform. So uh, two more desserts we're gonna talk about. We're gonna go into cherry pie and then a classic pear tart, and then we'll dive into your questions. So cherry pie. When I saw this recipe, uh, chef, there's four different components. Tell me, tell me <laughs> what's going on. And why it's is it complicated or time consuming or? Well, we you know what, you know what. After grading now um, uh, for a while, uh, the students actually they react like you. They say this is a lot of work for a cherry pie, but once they 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 eat a slice of that cherry pie, then they understand the the why we have a crust. Uh, a layer of almond cream, a layer of cherry filling, and a layer of crumble. Uh, of course, you could bypass uh, some of those. If you don't want to put the crumble or the almond cream, you can do that. But at the end of the day, if you already go through the, the process of making this, why not go all the way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, and see where this is taking you to. And, and so far, I didn't have one person who was complaining that uh, it's too much work for uh, for the result. All right. Well, let's let's show the first step on this, uh, Patrick. Make sure that the dough is brought down to the bottom of the pan and fits squarely into the corners. Dock the bottom and the side. Mark the top edge by pressing a fork into the dough. Chill the dough in the refrigerator for about 10 minutes or until firm. All right, so that's a cool video, a uh, perfectly uh, round piece of dough being uh, formed into the crust. What's the most important thing, um, Chef, we should know? Well, uh, it's the lining of the dough. The dough has to be put uh, an, at an angle, really it has to be put in the corner of that pie pan. If it's not, if the dough is like this and, and the, the corner of the pan is not occupied with dough, what will happen to this dough when you, when you uh, bake it, pre-bake it, it will slide down. And then mm -hmm. uh, it's the beginning of the end already there. <laughs> so you gotta make sure that you align the, the, the pan really well and also you need to, with a fork, you need to make small holes. This is called docking. And those holes are there so the, the water from the sweet dough, or any kind of dough, by the way, that you're using, will have a chance to evaporate uh, from, the, from the, the pie. Otherwise, when you pre-bake this, this pie, if you don't make dough, uh, holes, it will make a dome. 
and by the time you figure it out, uh, it's already baked and hard like a rock. You, you failed. You failed already there. So it's pastry is like this. It's a lot of little little steps that mm -hmm. you need to follow. There's no winging in pastry. There is no, oh, uh, you know, we can just do it a different way. It's <clears throat> there is a reason for the instruction. It's because it will help you uh, uh, succeed in the recipe making. So this pie crust, I love it. Would it? Could I use it with a uh, apple pie or you can use it for pie? apple pie? Yes, absolutely. Apple pie, pump, pumpkin pie. And like mm -hmm. I said, uh, uh, some people like sweet dough, some people like pie dough for cherry pie, whatever, you know, whatever makes them happy. Yeah. Uh, uh, and but uh, the technique will stay the same. That's very important. So so the concept of putting it in the oven and baking it, blind baking it, what's your opinion on uh, using beans, lining it with some foil and put some beans. What's the difference between docking and the beans? They know it kind of get the no. same uh, process, keeping it from doughing. Yeah, it's, it's the same. Some people just do docking. <clears throat> Here at the school, we just do docking because we've been doing this for decades and, and, and our, the dough does not collapse for us. But uh, uh, you could dock the dough and line, line the dough with a parchment paper or, um, or foil, you said, right? Yep. And uh, and then you put beans, like hard beans that you buy uh, in the supermarket, and mm -hmm. they, they make great weights for pies, and, and you can reuse those beans over and over again. No need to buy expensive pie weights. Right. Uh, another way to do it is you, you get a piece of cheesecloth that you put in your pie pan, kind of like a large piece of cheesecloth. You put your beans, and then you just close the cheesecloth and you tie it with a little 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 uh, something and um, it will a string thank you and and then you have a purse yep. a purse that you can take out easily and put back in for another pie you see so so it's easier to control the beans with a purse like this so tell me uh, I know some people will make a pumpkin pie and just pour the dough or the um, the batter onto the raw dough and bake it Start at 400, 425. Would you blind bake this dough and then add the filling for a pumpkin pie for the perfect yes. pumpkin pie? Absolutely, absolutely, yep. definitely. Uh, uh, there's no reason why why you could not do that. Yeah, I have a. Some people in my family don't want to do that, and I'm like it's going to be soggy, and it's always soggy on the bottom. I'm like, well, if we blind bake it, we're going to have a crusty crush on the bottom too, not just the sides. <laughs> yeah, well, it's my it's my battle. <laughs> so uh, the next concept we want to show you on the cherry pie is the almond filling. Patrick? Fit a pastry bag with a pastry tip and fill with almond cream. Pipe a spiral beginning in the center of the dough. So that was very pretty. What's, uh, what's the purpose of that perfect piping circle, Chef? It's, it's the reason why we show this, this piping is, is to make sure that we have the same amount of almond cream everywhere. And again, if you have a, a thicker layer on one side and a thinner on the other side, it's not going to bake the same and, and problems are going to arise. Uh, you could also put the almond cream in there and then kind of get a, like a small spoon or, or an offset spatula that works too. But, you know, the... The piping always helps us uh, actually continue to to practice in our piping skills. So we, we, we like the we like that way. And uh, what's the point of having this almond filling in a cherry pie? The almond filling uh, actually um, the flavor of almond goes really well with uh, the flavor of cherry because inside the cherry cherry pit. I don't know if you ever cracked the cherry pit open. Mm -hmm. If you crack it open and you eat it. It's a small almond. <clears throat> yeah. So almonds, uh, the flavor of almond always goes well with cherry. It's a, it's a sure win. And not only this, but it's also a layer that will bring a nice texture, but it's going to absorb the moisture coming from the cherries, you see? So it's, it use, it's, it's kind of like a sponge there. Great. Well, let's show the cherry filling and then the strudel um, topping. And then uh, okay. put the whole thing together. Cool. Pour the cherry filling over the almond cream and layer the streusel. <clears throat> so, 
So chef, how, how often do you make a cherry pie and where do you find your cherries for the filling? <laughs> I, f I find them in the supermarket because they, they're perfectly fine. The, the cherries, uh, uh, one need, needs to know that all the frozen fruit are frozen during the, the, the season, the summer right. season. So uh, it's, it's very often better to, to, for, for most of recipes to, to, to use frozen raspberries instead of fresh raspberries in December. You see, right. and, and cherries is the same thing. Uh, uh, you're not going to find cherries in, in December, uh, at least not in Chicago. And yeah. uh, and uh, using frozen cherries is perfectly fine, you know. And uh, what's the point of the strudel topping, the crumble? Oh, this, yeah, that's just to add another, another uh, layer of happiness. It's a nice crunch, adds a nice crunch to it. Again, it's not necessary, but uh, once you once you cut a slice, which is going to be our next shot, you cut a slice of that, and you put a scoop of your ice cream there, Scott. Uh, um, it gets very close to heaven, I would say. Well, I'm I'm going to have to change my mind. Maybe instead of the pear tart, I might make this. Let's show that yeah, last, forget about that that last pear shot. Yeah, <laughs> let's show the last shot, Patrick. So yeah, a slice of heaven. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's it, and and if it's well made, you will see that the cherry filling will want to to fall apart, but it's not. It's holding its shape. It's just it's just super uh, super shiny, and 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 you can tell it's not one of those cherry filling that is yeah. very very hard, you know, and it's not too soft. So that's all a question of cooking. Adding the right thickener, it's everything is. Uh, we pastry chefs are geeks, and we, when we look at a recipe, we dissect it completely in uh, in ingredients, what's in the ingredients, and then how to control them. We also, we we also are control freaks, because at the end of the day, if, if the cherry pie falls apart in the in the plate, that's a big problem. Yeah. So. Uh... Thanks for picking this uh, recipe. There's four components, but I, I look forward to tackling it myself. <laughs> so let's uh, let's take a look at the last recipe we're going to talk about, and then we'll go into uh, Q and A and answer your questions. So the pear okay. tart. This is uh, something I had done years ago before. I'd kind of looked at the recipe here and saw the filling is very similar to what I had done before. And I used to add uh, toasted ground hazelnuts and yes. uh, brown butter and uh, rosemary. Those three yes. flavors I thought really complemented the pears, but I, I love this uh, this basic uh, pear tart. What can you tell us about why you wanted to include this today? Well, uh, uh, also the technique. I wanted to show the technique of using a ring, a ring instead of a pie pan or a tart pan. Is because in in uh, in professional pastry making we use only rings. Okay, and uh, in in the next video you will see you will see how we use a ring like this how we grease it, how we line it. But <clears throat> the ring is, is going to sit on a sheet tray. And even if the filling is oozing out, let's say, it's not going to be stuck on the bottom of the pie pan because there's no pie pan, you see? So there's never any problems, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have, have, they make pies or something and there's some leakage and now they try to like extract it with some kind of... <laughs> like a, a, a spatula or something, and right. it, it just becomes really difficult. So the ring completely removes all those problems. Great, let's, uh, let's show the first uh, recipe. Lightly apply butter to the tart ring. Wipe the excess with a paper towel. So very basic, uh, how to butter a ring. Where, where do we find these rings? I've seen them before in... Uh, oh couple stores uh, but where would you go yeah you can you can go to any specialty store uh, uh, in, um, sur la table William Sonoma Bed Bath and Beyond stores like this uh, Amazon you can find them online but they're just gal galvanized metal uh, rings and they come in any sizes in a very small size or very large mm -hmm. and um, they're just very convenient you know yeah all right let's uh, let's show about rolling the dough uh, on the next one, Patrick. Yes. 
Place the pastry rulers on each side. Roll in alternating directions and dust as needed. Chill the dough on the sill pad if it becomes too warm when rolling. So that's neat, uh, using those bars again. Um, what, what's the, yes. what's the um, height of those bars? Huh? Excuse me? Um, how thick are those? Are those like... Uh... Oh, the any thickness is uh, 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 Rose Levy Berenbaum has, uh, has a set on Amazon. It's, uh, they go from one eighth of an inch to uh, a quarter, I believe, this uh, set of three. And you can also stack them on top of each other to get an a even different height. And um, the one she does, as uh, she sells, is are made out of silicone. So they're not bars that uh, if you bend, then now they're like unusable. Those right. are kind of like a, a silicone that is soft enough and hard enough at the same time. Okay. Um, let's show a couple more videos and uh, bring it to the point of uh, the final dish. So let's see uh, lining the ring. Yes, very important. Make sure the dough is brought down to the bottom of the tart ring and fits squarely into the corners. Press firmly against the side of the ring. All right, so uh, now I'm gonna add uh, the filling in the pears. What, what should I do? What's my most important consideration when I uh, do this? Well, you have the first. You have to line the ring uh, also really well. Make sure it's it's in the corners of the of the um, ring. But then after that, uh, you can use a, a, an almond cream. But the almond cream could be changed into a peanut cream, a hazelnut cream. All you need to do is find hazelnut powder or a peanut powder or pecan powder. You can change that recipe around. You see, you could change this recipe into a pecan and peach peach tough, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, yes. uh, but uh, the, um, the fruit is usually canned fruit, or if you can poach them yourself, uh, they, um, they will work really well in a syrup, infused syrup with some herbs or something. Mm -hmm. uh, if the pear are really ripe, you can just use them as is. It's not a problem. Perfect. And tell me, uh, so after I've rolled it out and lined the ring, um, I should refrigerate it, right? Yes, you should refrigerate it so everything stabilizes, you know? Very okay. important. All right. Let's uh, show the last video, uh, Patrick. Arrange them in a spiral, touching the edge of the dough with the wider end, leaving the center of the almond cream exposed. Sprinkle with almonds and refrigerate for 30 minutes. Okay, so you mentioned uh, using canned fruit or poaching your own. Um, I've I've always poached my own pears, and when I've done tarts like this, I would like to use uh, boss pears because they're firm. Yes. And then poach them in a, in a white wine sauterne, um, you know, maybe a little bit of orange peel, um, bay leaf, and kind of get a little unique. And then when I cut them, I'm always making sure uh, the pointy end goes towards goes towards the center, so we can get a nice spiral, right? A nice spiral and also uh, uh, the <clears throat> the center of the of the tart is what's going to bake less you see if you put the, the the thin end on the edges they will burn right okay? so it's it's a two prong uh, uh, reason the look obviously makes a nice spiral but also the the baking and mm -hmm. um, and also, yes, you're right. You you can use many different fall spices uh, that we use in uh, in Thanksgiving uh, uh, dishes: uh, the cinnamon, the nutmeg, the ginger, and so on. Those can all be infused in this pear, and and uh, and even in the in the almond cream. Nothing stops you to to put some of those spices in the almond cream. So is this a dessert that can be made uh, ahead of time, let's say a day ahead of time, or should we be oh, yeah. baking it the day of? You could make it today and then freeze it, and, but no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> you can make it a, a, day, a day ahead of Thanksgiving and it will be perfectly fine. Actually, it's, I like it better the next day because yeah. 
all the flavors have a chance to infuse and um, the crust is still going to be nice and crunchy but the center will kind of like <clears throat> i don't want to call it mushy but it will be very nice and moist yep well excellent yeah. because uh, i'm planning for next week right now and i know i want to do uh, the crust probably the sweet dough um, this week and maybe the ice cream this weekend and then decide which one I want, the pear tart or the cherry. Great. Great. So let's uh, show that last final um, shot, Patrick. Okay. Our pear and almond cream tart is simple, yet an elegant combination perfect for a special occasion or dessert enjoyed at home. All right. Well, that's a, a nice finished dish. What would you serve with this, Chef? Ice cream. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> uh, like a spice ice cream or something like a cinnamon ice cream, uh, pumpkin ice cream, uh, you name it. Uh, but I see, I see, I would serve it slightly warmish, the, mm -hmm. the, the tart, and then hit it with some ice cream, you know? Yeah, I'm thinking if I do this, I'm going to do it uh, a couple of days ahead of time, let it sit yeah. at room temperature, and then cut the actual pieces and warm them so we get the warm crusty on the edges. Yes, nice. yes, yes. And maybe a little caramel sauce would not, caramel bourbon would not hurt, you know? Yeah, that's what I usually do when I do poached pears. I'll take some of that uh, poaching liquid and reduce yes. it down until I start to make a caramel and then finish it up with the cream and the butter to make Very the poached nice. pear caramel sauce. You could be a pastry chef. Well, that's what I wanted to do before I uh, became uh, a savory chef when I was younger. Yeah. I was baking uh, you in college. saw the light, but then you, you got distracted. <laughs> I saw the light. I love the precision, but I also thought I better know everything about cooking, not just the pastry. It's good. With no, it's all, no good. <laughs> all respect, chef. No, no, all good. All right. So let's, uh, let's go into some questions and answers from uh, the group here. Uh, so we have uh, the first question from Catherine. So for sure, for years, she's made the same pie crust with butter and shortening, a little iced vodka, and it's okay. Uh, do we have any tips to make it actually taste better? I have a couple uh, recommendations, but Chef, you take this one first. Well, it's all it's all about um, the ingredients. You got to make sure you use a butter, European style butter. We use Plugra, which is 82% fat. <clears throat> That's already a, a big step towards uh, <clears throat> greatness is the quality of ingredients. Uh, you can use vodka or not. It, it, the, the vodka is, is there because the vodka is, is a liquor that does not uh, trigger the gluten uh, in the dough, but you can use water too. That works too. If some people don't want to use it for whatever reason, it's fine. Uh, and after that, it's in the method. <clears throat> I do not overwork the dough. And you got to make sure you have, you have uh, enough butter in your dough uh, if you want to talk in percentage, compared to the compared to the flour, the butter should should be about 60 percent uh, uh, compared to the flour. So, if we speak in grams, if you have a, a hundred grams of flour, you should have 60 grams of butter. Got to have a, a good amount of butter and and high quality butter. You know, a couple of other things I might add is. Make sure there's enough salt in the crust. If there's no salt yes. in the recipe, you're not going to have anything highlighting it. I would also add a teaspoon or so of uh, sugar, just for the sugar and salt to make it okay. And Catherine, I'm not sure if this is it's okay because of flavor or texture. Because uh, the big thing around texture I do know is that make sure your butter is ice cold. So whenever I'm making a crust, and I'm usually doing it, I don't know, Chef, if you're going to agree with this. I've done it in the yes, Cuisinart I method. Uh, and I add the butter and I pulse it until uh, the butter's, you know, the fat is coated with the flour. And then yes. it's kind of almost just a powder almost. And I'll pour it down into the plastic wrap and then I'll wrap it and then kind of press it in. And uh, it's kind of, it's really flaky, but it's kind of uh, tough to work with sometimes because I haven't built the gluten up at all. So the reason why we mix the cold butter with the flour first is because the, the cold butter is going to wrap itself around the the flour and it's going to prevent the gluten from being in contact with the water in the recipe that is added later on. Later on you add the water. So we add, we mix the butter first with the flour, it becomes kind of like a crumble yep. and then and then we add the water. It's kind of like tricking the gluten. See if you if you do the same pie dough and you, you mix everything together in one shot and the butter is soft, you'll have a dough that is 
slightly less short, it will be less crumbly and it will be a little bit more elastic and might shrink. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks, Catherine, for the question. Um, I hope you uh, have some success this year in making a, a better than okay crust. Um, next uh, question, not a question, a comment from Kate. I'm currently taking the course and it's incredible. I did not realize how much I did not know and how many new pastry recipes to learn. Highly recommend. Well, Kate, good to see you here. Uh, I've been seeing your work and I know Chef has uh, graded a few of your projects. Yes. So thank you. Great work, Kate. Uh, next question. Uh, what is the difference between a uh, pot sucre and pot brise? And I'm probably butchering it again, Chef. So you let's are. hear your accent. You <laughs> <laughs> pot sucre is sweet dough. Uh, uh, it contains uh, a sugar, eggs, and even in ours, we put a little bit of almond powder for a better flavor. And, and the pie dough does not contain eggs or sugar. So that's the big difference. And then uh, there's other doughs out there that are cousins of that. Like a pie dough can contain a small amount of sugar, like you mentioned. Uh, uh, and even some people put a little bit of eggs, like rebels, they put a little bit of eggs in, in pie dough. But the big, the, the big difference is, I mentioned it before, is the sweet dough is really for sweet tarts. It, it would not make sense to make a quiche, for instance, with sweet dough, okay? And, uh, and a pâte brisée actually could, because it does not have any sugar, could be used for both. You see, uh, it's okay to make a sweet, to put a sweet filling in a, in a pâte brisée or a pie dough, because the, the sweetness of the filling can, can, uh, can mix nicely maybe with the, the, the dough that is, uh, I don't want to call it salty, but just not sweet. Okay, thank you, Chef. Um, next question from Betty and Peter. What's the best way to make a flaky pie crust without shortening? Shortening? Like shortening the, the fat shortening? Yeah, I think that old school American recipes are going to have shortening in it, be it lard yes. or Crisco. And those are two things that are referred to as shortening. And I, okay. I know that they're there for texture and flavor. So if you don't want to use lard or Crisco, what would you uh, use to make a nice pie crust? You, you, you got to use butter. Uh, and, and shortening was invented, uh, I, my history is fuzzy, um, but uh, I want to say uh, around World, World War II or something like this, uh, it's not that important. What's important is it was, it was created uh, because there was a shortage of butter and, um, and it, it uh, was integrated in recipe books and by by grandmothers in, in this country, and and uh, and now uh, people find those books and those recipes. They have them, uh, and uh, they want to use shortening for that. But what uh, what I say is uh, uh, shortening shortening is a fat. It's a hundred percent fat, so there's no water in there. That's why it does a great job at at creating this crumbly texture. You see. Uh, the less water there is in fat, the, the crumblier the, the texture of the, the dough or cookie or this and that. But shortening has zero flavor whatsoever. It's a highly processed fat. It's, uh, it's, um, it does not melt in the sun, which bothers me because <clears throat> if it doesn't melt in the sun, it, won't, it will not melt in my body. And, uh, and, and so... For the people who are purists, they say, oh, I, I want to I wanna make a pie crust with shortening. I say, okay, let me get a piece of bread and I'll put some shortening and you'll eat it. You know, and they're like, oh no, why would I do that? That's disgusting. So well then, <laughs> right. then it should not be in your pie crust. All right, so well, you're not a fan I, of it. So you can say, make it without it. <laughs> I'm not a fan of it because it just does not bring any flavor whatsoever. And uh, it, the only advantage is um, it, does not have any water, but a high fat European style butter will uh, will remedy this. And and at the end of the day, there's nothing tastes as good as butter in my opinion. Okay, so that brings us to our next question, Chef, which I'll let you take. From Christine, what's a good substitute for butter in pie crust recipes? She has family members who are allergic to milk. Sure, sure, you can use, uh, <clears throat> if you have to, you can use shortening, I just say you shouldn't, but uh, when it comes to allergies, we, we don't want people to get sick. 
then after that you have margarine and then you have ghee uh, uh, but ghee is also made from uh, from milk so that's probably not gonna work so margarine is um, is is one uh, one thing lard lard can work but it ha will have that particular flavor that that might or might not work okay uh, so those those should work lard is the same thing it does not contain any water so that might that might be a good substitute or, or margarine after that you have coconut oil that that can be used so for some recipes yeah uh, yeah yeah that works too uh, it's one of the only only fat uh, liquid fat that um, hardens there's another one a certain type type of palm oil that hardens but um, there's a few options out there yeah I think I'll try the coconut oil um, I have some okay. that makes sense um, moving on to the next question from LJ comment on different types of rolling pins and which is best which do you like best rolling pin uh, Jeff can you grab a rolling pin uh, Jeff our our producer is going to get a rolling pin because uh, actually uh, I am very happy that this question comes out because um, I'll show you the rolling pin that I've been using for the last 44 years and uh, it's it's in my opinion it's the best one it's not because I use it it's just because that's the one we use in um, in the professional bake bakeries <laughs> Uh, you have rolling pins that are pretty wide and with two handles. Those handles actually are not very convenient because they, um, the handles um, don't put the weight where uh, the dough is. You see, when we, we this is a, just a piece of wood uh, with rounded edges, makes it convenient. And uh, it's made out of hard wood. There's many different types of wood. And... Um, when we roll, we want to roll here. There you go. And uh, Jeff is telling me we cannot see it. So, okay. Uh, so when we roll, we put our hands right here where the, where, the pressure, where the pressure needs to be. If you have a rolling pin with handles, the pressure is on the side. It's not as, not as uh, uh, efficient, okay? And then there's other rolling pins that are tapered towards the end. Those ones, in my opinion, they don't work for us. Uh, we actually received them by mistake. Uh, the school it was the wrong shipment, and we had to start the program uh, uh, with those rolling pins, and the students were just not not pleased because the 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 thick the center part is a little thicker, and this is tapered. And then when you roll out, you have to be really, really good at rolling out to make sure that the dough is one, one thickness, okay? So this is your guy right here, okay? And you never wash it, never ever wash it. You just scrape it with a plastic scraper, not with a metal scraper, yeah? And you can have it for life, really. There's no reason to not, to not uh, uh, have this forever. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, my experience is my mother had one with the handles and I always did not want to use the handles. Just instinctively would go into the middle and uh, apply the pressure there. So thanks, yes. Jeff. Oh, and, and there's some that are made out of silicone and uh, others are made out of marble or something. You don't need, you don't need to use any of those. Uh, I mean, the silicone might work. I, I just never use them. Uh, I just like the feel of wood. It's just very, uh, very pleasing and, and it works really well. Great. We have a recommendation here from uh, Chef Fran for uh, types of uh, fat to use instead of butter. Um, there's a vegan cultured butter. Um, I'm probably gonna butcher this, Miyokos. Chef um, Fran. Hi, Fran. Thank you for that input, Chef. Yes. Um, moving on to the next one. What, uh, from Emily here, what makes uh, the Pastry School Ruby program different? Well, we, uh, it's, it's the perfect storm between uh, Ruby and the French Pastry School. Ruby brings this expertise uh, uh, for more than 15 years of teaching, of teaching uh, programs, and, and they brought it to a science uh, uh, from uh, 
uh, bringing the content, uh, really uh, fresh content, very well presented, great uh, assessment, uh, great learning system, I would say, where the support is constant with the students because I do it all day long and I, and I see how it works. It's very, very efficient. It's very quick. And, and to this, we uh, is added uh, French pastry school expertise, uh, 25 years of uh, brick and mortar teaching. We, we now making some of those recipes available to anybody around the world. You see um, the big difference, uh, Scott, is when, uh, when somebody takes a class, uh, any, any kind of class, uh, uh, hands on, is you, you see the chef perform a technique and that will last, what, 15 seconds, 30 seconds at most. And then hopefully you didn't have your head down writing notes, right? Because maybe you just missed the boat. Uh, the beautiful thing with, uh, with, with the instructional videos that we provide is uh, people can refer to that video until the end of time. They can really stop it, watch it, practice, do it again as many times as they want to. So that's... To me, that's luxury for a student. And then yeah. the, the fact that they, they, they will always have questions and, and uh, we, we are an open book. And so whatever they would like to know, we answer it on a daily basis. Yep, that's, uh, as, as those of you with Ruby know, we have a support team who will uh, answer your technical slash um, cooking questions. Um, and uh, I get a lot of those in today uh, during the time too. So let's move on. Um, next question is options for vegan. So we, we did recommend uh, the vegan uh, cultured butter. Any other options for vegan, um, Chef? Well, uh, we don't have many of that because uh, uh, you, you do have a, a vegan pastry program, a wonderful vegan pastry yep. program in, in, uh, in the Ruby selection. But at the end of the day, um, uh, you need to look at, at different oils, and uh, um, we mentioned those. And then egg substitute is uh, is another one that that needs to be tackled. And we we touch on this a little bit, not not a lot, because um, again, uh, this introduction to pastry program it, it is what it says. We touching on many different types of recipes, from uh, muffins to um, pound cakes to ice creams caramel, candies, truffles, baguette, uh, pies, uh, you name it, uh, puff pastry. So we're really covering uh, a broad ground, okay? And my wish is that uh, very soon we will be able to release a new uh, program with more in-depth recipes on certain topics. Thank you, Chef. So Sylvia, to answer your question, uh, essential vegan desserts with Chef uh, Fran, we have that a program that uh, is all vegan. So a little bit different yes. with in terms of ingredients and technique. So uh, just different schools of thought. So uh, next question from uh, Alina. Uh, options for vegan, we just spoke about. And also, can these recipes be shared? So there is a link here under the video that says get started. Um, these are all the snippets of the videos that we've shown you today. So you have those. Uh, but when you do enroll in the program, you can actually go to the recipe and print the recipe as a PDF and share it with somebody for sure. Um, next question here, moving forward. Will there be any continuing education courses from the French Pastry School to take after I complete this course? Uh, Emily, That's great, a question. great question. We great are question, Emily. moving forward. So, uh, <laughs> Chef, take it from here. I know you've got it all in your back pocket. <laughs> There's nothing in my back pocket. Uh, uh... Yes, Emily, uh, we, we, we will be very happy to uh, open our doors again, hopefully after this health crisis is over. And, and it would be wonderful to actually welcome uh, many of our Ruby students because uh, we all became uh, 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 friends uh, uh, while working on this program together. So that, that's a great idea actually to do a, a follow-up for continuing education classes after this uh, program. Great idea, Emily. Thanks. Um, next uh, question from Jamie. I'm currently enrolled and love the course. Thank you, Chef Jackie. I'm going to make traditional crepes tomorrow, but in reading the ingredients list, it seems like it will make a lot. Can you divide it in half without affecting my grade? 
<laughs> I, I, yes, you can divide it in half yes, without Jamie. affecting your grade. Yes, Jamie, you can you can cut the recipe in half, uh, and uh, it will not affect your grade. Uh, you know, there's something about grades. Um, grades are very important, of course, but at the end of the day, it's the product that uh, will be, be your grade, right? And if if uh, I always tell the students that they learn much more from failures than than from a perfect product, right? If uh, we have some students, they had to make a recipe two, three times because something did not work out. And we help the students, uh, it was for Katja, and we helped the students to make it and it came out incredibly beautiful. Well, that student learned so much about developing gluten and it's something that she will now be able to use for any other bread recipe. So this is a uh, great for those of you that are in the class. Uh, you know the program it gives you an opportunity to upload pictures. So for those of you that, that are not in the class, um, there's you know 20 units and there's 16 projects. So you're going to upload a picture of the crepes, um, and typically each assignment will be uh, mise en place, all of your ingredients in place, uh, the technique and process, making the crepes in the pan, uh, the finished crepe, and maybe the crepe in a dish. Um, the same thing goes for the pies and the tarts. So then Chef, Jackie and team will be grading these. And if you have any questions, you can ask them um, during this time. In addition to if your grade isn't perfect, they'll tell you exactly why and if you need to do it again. So it's more about the learning process with Ruby as opposed to being punitive for grades. Yeah, So it's never, never punitive. Thank you. Uh, next Chef uh, question is uh, from Vicky. Uh, sable, sucre, brise. What is the difference between them and what is the appropriate use of each one? So we've talked about a, uh, two of those. What is a uh, uh, pat sable? I, I did not. Pat sable right. <coughs> is a, in English you could call it short dough. It's a it's a cousin of the sweet dough, pat sucre. So pat sable has more butter, uh, more eggs, and um, also nut powder. So it's more uh, fragile, a little bit more fragile. Not not that bad. And uh, it will actually taste better. It's not as sturdy as sweet dough. And I'm going to give you another thousand dollar trick: is uh, if you take the egg yolk in the in a pat sable, a short crust. If you take those egg yolks and you cook them, uh, uh, the easiest way is to make hard boiled eggs. And you take that hard boiled egg yolk in there, and you use this instead of the fresh egg yolk in the recipe. It will make uh, uh, the most crumbliest uh, uh, pat sable or shortbread dough that you'll ever make. Because <clears throat> by cooking the egg yolk, you evaporate the water in this in this egg yolk. And, and so that, that dough will not come together as easily. And then it will be really, really good to eat. Uh, so moving on. Um... Who grades these assignments in this course? So I think we've touched on it a few times. Any Chef, other questions? Chef Jackie. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know where I've. I can see the questions. Um, who grades the assignment needed. in the course? Uh -huh. I grade the assignment in the course together with uh, three of our uh, teachers at the French Pastry School. And we do this on a daily basis. Um, we, uh, like Scott said, we see the uh, see the photos. It's like three or four photos of, of each uh, for each product. The first photo shows the mise en place, and then after that, the 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 butter or the mixture, and then the finished finished product. Okay, thank you, Chef. Uh, next question is uh, from Ingla from uh, with regards to ice cream. Do I need an ice cream machine, or I can make the recipe without one? If so, how? You know, I've asked this question to myself before, and I, I actually <laughs> splurged for um, the cheaper, which is not a machine, but an actual hand churning one, which uh, typically goes for the 40 to $50. But it's Chef, is there another way? <laughs> it's still a machine. It's I know that machine, here, in high schools, they, here in high school, they said they, they showed um, the, the trick of with the ice cubes in a bag, and then you shake it. Uh huh. <clears throat> That works for high school, but for us, you need some kind of a device to uh, to be able to churn is to mix the the mixture, the ice cream mixture, quickly 
while cooling it at the same time. So you need those two. You need motion and then very cold temperature. So usually that that's it's some kind of a device, you know? Yeah, the, the hand cranker that I used to use um, was constant. You couldn't stop, otherwise it would seize up. <laughs> yes, so. yes. All right, thanks for that question. Um, Julia, this has been a great program. I've really enjoyed learning the various techniques and added to what I already knew. I highly recommend this class. Thank you, Julia. I Thank appreciate you, Julia. your comments. Um, next question from Adam. Who is this program geared towards? In uh, oh, great general, question. go for it, Chef. Great question. Uh, well, we have uh, people from all spectrum, uh, uh, really. We have, uh, we have people that have never baked before and they, it was always like, something they wanted to do but they were afraid of asking or, or because they um they they are afraid that it's too complicated and then we have people that are already uh uh baking a lot at home and then i even have some professional savory chefs that um uh, uh want to learn a little bit more about the the why and the how uh, baking works and and so but it's mostly food enthusiasts, I would say. Um, yeah. This first uh, cohort we took in September, I'd say more than 50% of them are home cooks who have been yes. baking for years and they just wanted to find out exactly uh, the proper way, the proper technique and have support yes. um, by someone like Chef Jackie in the French Pastry School. All right, thank you. So Jason, uh, next question is, uh, how long will it take to complete the course and how many recipes are included? So the, the course itself is uh, 60 hours approximately uh, in timing that we've created. There are about 40 recipes provided. So if you were to do it a couple few hours a day, five days a week, it'd take you about 120 days. So about yeah. 60 hours of time. Um, and going through the course in the beginning and going and reading through and seeing what's uh, on your plate per se in terms of production, will be able to uh, first prepare you for your timing in addition to what ingredients you're going to need and the equipment. So mise en place is everything. So uh, mise en place is everything. preparation is everything. So I would say 60 hour course, breaking it up in the amount of time that you have. But there's uh, yes. anything else you want to add, Chef? Well, some people go faster than others. Some people will complete the course. Uh, they, they, they're, really, uh, they're really into it and they work on the weekends and this and that. And, and others just work, like you say, two, three hours a day. So it's not a speed race. It's 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 whatever you want it to be, which is also the beauty of of online teaching. Is is whatever yep. you want it to be. You know. Yep. Um, yeah, and to also point out that it doesn't need to be taken sequentially. The first four or five, no. uh, actually five units, are all about getting ready in the kitchen and some of the basics, and then it goes into cookies. It is recommended to take it sequentially, so you can kind of build on your knowledge and build on your skill sets because the first unit is cookies and the final unit is uh, candies. So you've had to do yes. breads and tarts and pies and ice creams uh, between that. So it kind of builds on technique specifically. Yeah. Uh, next question, will the program teach me how to temper chocolate? Uh, yes. There is uh, a short, go ahead, Chef. There's a short, uh, there's a section in the, in the back um, of the program, at the end of the program where we teach dark chocolate truffles. And then we, we teach you how to, uh, warm the chocolate to the right temperature in order to coat those uh those truffles and and uh i'm very happy to say that uh, a lot of the truffles that are graded uh have been made successfully and and so the, the instruction works well and and a lot of those students have, had never dealt with chocolate and 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 how to warm it and how to not use it uh, at too cold of a temperature or too hot of a temperature so so yes, we touch on this definitely. Excellent, thank you, Chef. And uh, also there is a program on uh, chocolate. So we'll be coming out, uh, work, we're working on one for next year coming from uh, Chef yes. Jackie. Um, question here, is there an equipment ingredient list that is included in the program? So from Allison here, this is a, uh, every recipe will have an ingredient uh, equipment list of what you will need, be needing and going through the recipes, it'll also list all the ingredients. So yes. definitely a place to find everything you need before you get going. Yeah. Um, next question from Liz. Um, why should I take this course? <laughs> Great question, Chef. Why, why, why not? should anybody <laughs> why take not? the course? It's, uh, it's, 
why should I take this course? It's because uh, we will uh, we will explain again. We'll explain that why the recipes work, why they don't work. Uh, it's very important. Uh, it's not just a, a course where uh, you have a, a recipe and then just an instruction and this, that's it. You just make it and, and you're successful or not. We guide you uh, from the beginning with uh, so, some facts of food science, some explanation of techniques, why certain techniques are used and, uh, and, and, and so on. And, and the ingredients, what's in the ingredient and why we're using this versus that. So it's much more than just a bunch of recipes uh, put together. Yeah, just to um, elaborate on that, Liz, if you're part of Ruby and any other courses, you know, we keep talking about the recipes, but the the principles be behind each recipe is discussed. So the way the format would be is in the objectives of the core or the, the unit, um, an introduction to the topic, uh, the principles behind what you're going to learn, and then a practice recipe to actually do the principle that you've been taught. So it's not just about making recipes, it's about learning the, the backbone of the why. So thank you, Liz. Um, here's an interesting question, Shannon. How is baking different compared to savory cooking? So I was saying oh, earlier that I wanted to be a pastry cook <coughs> when I was younger, and it's very, very precise. How would you de define yes. the difference, um, Chef? I have a great example for that, that I always tell my students. I said pastry is completely different uh, from hot food, savory food, compare it to, to like making um, uh, a stew, a beef stew. Let's just say you're making a beef stew. You have some carrots, some garlic, some onions, some herbs. And guess what? You run out of carrots, you're going to put a little bit more whatever, sweet potatoes or something else, radishes. You run out of onions, you put a couple shallots, something. The stew will not fail. That's the big difference. For us in a recipe, if you have a recipe with so much flour, with so much sugar, so much egg, if you just feel like not putting all these eggs because, or just you don't have enough eggs, you cannot start making this recipe because our our uh, pastry recipes and not our recipes, uh, pastry and baking recipes are all about uh, reactions. Uh, the ingredients are already reacting with each other once they, they, they're just mixed with each other. There was something will already happen and then after that, once they cook or they bake, everything is transformed, okay? And you just have one shot. And, uh, and so that's what it, it's about. And, and trust me, I'm, I'm been do, I've been doing this 44 years and every once in a while, every, every maybe 10 years, I feel frisky on a weekend and I wanna bake like on some of those shows with just whatever is around me and with no, no, no scaling of any ingredients and every time it fails, okay? So, so it's, just, it's just a mindset that we ask our students to have. It just, just go, through the, go through the trouble of measuring, scaling the ingredients and then follow the procedure. And then you can make any recipe as many times as you want to in a row and it will always work. Good, good uh, analogy. I, I know when I was learning baking, I would be giving the ratios and it'd have to be 100 grams, 60 grams. And then when I was learning uh, savory cooking, the chef would just list ingredients, garlic, onions, peppers, olive oil, I'm like how much as well, as much as you <laughs> need. I mean, it's not that that basic, but very similar. There's so, no uh, winging in baking. There's no winging. Nope. So uh, Catherine, question here, please advise on the safety of using raw egg yolks in uh, tiramisu and uh, mayonnaise. Is there a method in which egg yolks can safely be incorporated while making those items? Well, they would have to be um, pasteurized somehow. Uh, your exo egg yolks cannot just be put raw in the, in the tiramisu. Uh, usually uh, when people make tiramisu, they mix the egg yolk with the sugar, they whisk it, and on a double boiler and until it reaches uh, 185 Fahrenheit, 85 Celsius, and, and then you cool it rapidly. You see, uh, mm -hmm. um, somehow that egg yolk has to be controlled, pasteurized, because maybe you'll eat the tiramisu the day off, maybe the next day and nothing will happen, but maybe you'll give it to a friend who will let it sit in the car for a few hours and, 
and, and the then, uh, yes, and so bad things will happen. So usually mixing the egg yolk with the sugar and pasteurizing it does the trick. Yeah, and for mayonnaise, um, you know, you can buy pasteurized egg yolks. Um, but in the past, when I've made mayonnaise, I'm using egg yolk and olive oil and you know lemon juice, and I'm using it yes. that day. So I'm yes. not uh, letting it sit around or putting it in the refrigerator till next month. So yes, proper, and the lemon uh, juice is an acid that actually uh, uh, is kind of like uh, I don't want to say it prevents the bacteria right. from uh, from uh, reproducing. It it just inhibits the yep. the action of the bacteria. All right, thanks, Catherine. Uh, Sarah, a question here. Is there any live or face-to-face -face instruction on the course? So in general, the course itself is online with postings of your images and emails back from the chef. So there's no face-to-face -face instruction. We uh, do uh, we are going to be doing some live events similar to this one um, where we'll feature techniques and sorts, but we're not doing any face-to-face -face or live instruction at this point. Um, next question, uh, do I need to be a professional to take this course? Um, not at all. Um, you could be a home cook who wants to learn how to make a baguette and you'll yes. uh, learn the, the methods, uh, the techniques, the rationale behind it, and then try it. No need to be a professional. That's no experience it's, uh, needed. No experience introduction. Needed. Um, question from Frank, um, actually moving on to Linda. How can you explain, or can you explain quickly how you shape the baguette from the initial round shape to the longer shape before scoring? Good question. Suggestions or tips? So we just showed <laughs> him the video of what you do to shape yes. and it looks like a block and then it's, we're scoring this long tube. Yes. Would you like so to answer that? So you want that? me to elaborate on that? I, I think you should. <laughs> well, we, uh, you see my hand, uh, uh, Jeff? Yeah? Here too? No. Okay. So first we need to shape shape the, the pieces of dough uh, in, into a ball uh, <clears throat> to kind of like start to tighten the, the structure of the dough. And then after that, we, uh, we press it flat and we fold it. We fold it one or two times and then we seal it to make sure that that fold holds its shape. You see? And... Uh, and frankly, uh, uh, baguette making or any type of bread making will just require repetition. You, 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 you a, a bread like baguette that requires folding is completely different than a bread that is just baking in a loaf pan that will hold its shape. Once you shape dough, it, it, the shaping really will di dictate the end result. So it's very, very important to uh, practice and practice and practice. Thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes here. I want to move through these questions um, from Ingla. I don't like too sweet desserts. Can I reduce the sugar content in a recipe or will there be negative effects on the rest of the ingredients? Well, <clears throat> well uh, all our recipes are uh, not all, but most of them uh, come from our instructions here at the French Pastry School. And uh, they are quite low in sugar. Um, Reducing reducing sugar, you can do you can get away with reducing five or ten percent of sugar compared to the recipe, but then you might get into trouble if you go too far because um because uh, it will affect the entire recipe. Uh, right. I suggest that you try the recipes the way they are because uh, after so many years of making the same recipes, we we don't have people telling us they are too sweet because. <clears throat> many, many years ago, back when I was uh, a teenager, when I started my apprenticeship, there was already, back in France, there was a wave of reducing sugar and re reducing fat. That was in the 70s, back in France. And, um, and that is stuck now in, in the recipes in France. It, they are less, less sweet than before and less fatty also. All right. All right, moving on. Um, thank you for the question and the answer. Uh, what ring size would you recommend for home use if you only wanted one or two from James? Chef, Na, do you have any nine recommend? inch. Nine, nine inch? inch. Yeah. Okay. Eight or nine inch is fine, you know. All right. So yeah. we have a question from Frank. Um, we've answer, answered this before, but we'll uh, go for it. 
who will be there to support me if I have any questions? Um, Chef Jackie, uh, Nicole, yes. myself. We have a group of uh, people who will respond to you and answer your questions at any given time. Absolutely, on a daily basis. That's what I'm going to do right after this live event. I'm going to jump on my screen and see what questions are, are asked yeah. today. We get a lot yes. of great questions. Uh, one this yes. morning was called uh, Sweet Dose Sadness. And this yes. person <laughs> had some issues. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure it works out right. Absolutely. Um, do you do the same process for soft rolls in terms of don't over mix from Chris? No, no so soft roll, you have, to, you have to mix the dough. Soft roll is, uh, is the same uh, recipe as uh, the toast bread recipe we have in uh, our, um, our Ruby pastry course. It's a dough that, uh, uh, it's a bread dough that contains milk and the milk is actually providing this nice uh, softer texture, you see. And there, for those kind of doughs, you want to uh, get the gluten going, you want to, this dough to be elastic. Right, thank you. Um, question from Alina. Can you recommend a course for gluten-free pastry baking? Mm. Do you have anything in mind? I, uh, well, we have, a, we have a, in our, uh, we're working on a, on a upcoming course um, which is going to be on quick breads, and uh, we have a few recipes on uh, on gluten free and uh, vegan also, just a few. But I don't know, uh, uh, Scott, if uh, Frank, no. if the if yeah, I don't know about not. a course, but I do know that um, Richard Kopedge, I'm not sure how to spell his last name, has been a chef for years at the CI up in uh, Hyde Park, and I've worked with him, and he has a gluten free cookbook on baking and uh, yes. some pastry and talks about the so, different uh, combinations, the different flour blends. I think he has 10 flour blends that make yes. use of rice flour, or tapioca flour. So that would be a good starting point. Uh, yes. Richard Kopech. Um, you know, uh, we, uh, we had a student here at the school who, um, who uh, took our program and, um, and then uh, for some reason she could not uh, eat any, any more wheat products. And what, what she did, she took our methods of making all the recipes and she just studied a little bit, like you said, the different types of flowers. And, uh, and she opened actually a bakery with only gluten-free product and, uh, and very successful bakery. So that said, uh, I'm saying that because before you start making gluten-free products, it would mm -hmm. be important for you to get some kind of a education in making product, big products, because the techniques are going to be the same. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, and then after that, like you say, certain flowers have certain, um, certain properties, like uh, rice flour has a glutinous effect on, on dough. So that means it gets sticky. Yeah. Yep. Tapioca uh, uh, is good texture builder. Corn, corn flour, corn starch are very good at absorbing moisture. Okay, so there's many, many different flours out there that uh, I encourage people to research, and they um, they all have different properties, uh, and usually it always comes uh, uh, in a blend because one flour does not do the trick. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and also some flowers have like kind of like an aftertaste, bitter aftertaste that is lingering. That's not good. <clears throat> and usually those uh, gluten-free uh, baked products contain some kind of uh, binder, uh, something that kind of like mimics gluten. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually gums are used. It's or guar gum or xanthan gum or, or Arabic gum. Those are gums that make, make the water and the flour stick with each other. And, and so um, uh, uh, there's lots of information out there, but I think the first thing is to learn the proper techniques yep. of making, making a big product, you know? Great. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, Alina. Uh, a couple more minutes here. Last question is, uh, what do you use frise dough for? From Kim. Frase, Frase. Frase dough. Yes. Frase dough is uh, usually sweet doughs or short shortbread doughs. Usually you don't frase 
the the um, pie dough or uh, 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 pat brise, those types of doughs. You usually frase the the sweet dough or the sable because they are they are higher in fat, and so you can pass them through that process. You see, so those doughs are usually used for cookies, uh, sweet tarts, and sweet pies. Thank you, chef. So a couple comments before we wrap. Um, I use a half 200 pan with Ziploc bag of ice and place it on my work surface, then roll. That would be cool. for uh, making a dough. Chris, um, Chris, odd numbers of ingredients are also important when plating. True. Um, yes. Chris, I use a spray bottle and spray the oven every three to five minutes, I assume, when you're making uh, bread um, instead of starting with a sheet pan with some uh, moisture in it. And yeah, uh, uh, to, to that, I would say just just put some water when you put the the loaves in the oven. But after that, you should not continue spraying because it will affect the crust of the of the dough. Yeah, it and open, it's more bubbles. Yeah, and opening the oven, I found I've done that method. It kind of you lose the yeah. heat. So starting it and yes. closing it, and all right, yeah. Nika, not a question. Just came to see Chef Jackie, FPS Hello. grad, two thousand four. Awesome. And to wrap it up, you two are awesome. T, thank you, thank you, Kim. This thank was you. A, this was great. We almost went an hour and a half. I'm glad we had answered all your questions, and uh, we will be doing another one um, December 9th, um, talking more about Christmas and yes. holiday and the season and Hanukkah cool. and uh, a variety of other ones. So thank you everyone for joining, uh, thank and you. enjoy your day.